In this lecture, the leading European proponent of the low carbohydrate diet, Dr. Andreas Ehrenfeld, will discuss what he's observed of changes in nutrition advice in Europe, particularly in the United Kingdom and Sweden, and compare that with what's happening in Australia, and come to the conclusion of how close are we to the tipping point when this diet becomes the prescribed diet for most patients with type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. So there is a food revolution going on around the world, a big change in how people believe about what food is good for health, what food is good for your weight. It's definitely going on here in South Africa. It's going on in other places as well. This is a recent crime scene. <laughs> a, yeah, a truck driver is getting arrested on the border to a small country in Northern Europe. So what is the crime? It's illegal smuggling of butter. <laughs> so why would anybody, anybody smuggle butter into a country? Well, because there's no butter in the stores, right? Because people ate it all, and they <laughs> desperately want more. It's true. How did this happen? Well, the story started exactly 31 years ago. In the year of 1984, you know, the year of the novel by George Orwell about Big Brother, sort of fitting because in the same year, a large campaign was launched to teach the American people to fear fat, like egg, eggs and bacon. And of course, the idea was that this kind of food raised cholesterol in the blood, that's what gives us heart disease. An unproven theory at the time, and now we know that it was a mistake. It doesn't help. And the worst part of it is, if you take out all the fat from food, you add in more carbohydrates like sugar, like flour. And boy, did we eat carbs. You know that the obesity rates tripled in one single generation. And we have one giant problem that's not going away. It's getting worse. This is extreme obesity in the US. BMI over 40, it's just exploding. So how can we stop this? Perhaps we can, get, we can learn something from where I come from, a small country in northern Europe called Sweden, a country of nine million people. And we are well known for three different things. Pop group ABBA, <laughs> of course. Yeah, they deserve an applause for sure. Nobel Prize, very nice. And then number three, fad diets. Yeah, here's the journal Lancet a couple of years ago. They had an article titled Fad Diets in Sweden of All Places. This nice place, place of ABBA and the Nobel Prize. Um, and here, a diet called low carb, high fat is ludicrously popular. How could that happen? And they were horrified. You know, this is what it looks like. Isn't it, you know, toxic? <laughs> Just looking at it? Might have to shut your eyes. Yeah. So you avoid sugar and starch, you know that you eat all the other real food that you want. It's called LCHF in Sweden, it's called Banting here, same thing basically. And we've been desperately needing new thinking in Sweden too, because have a look at what's happened in the last few decades in Sweden. This is from 1985 up until 2008, the sales of butter in Sweden. And you see it's way down. We also were advised to avoid this dangerous, toxic stuff to not get heart disease, right? And it was also believed that if you take away the fat, you get less calories and you're going to lose weight. That's not what happened anywhere else, and that's not what happened in Sweden either, because you, of course, you tend to take away the fat and you add sugar instead. It's not a good idea. So here's statistics on overweight and obesity in Sweden, the same time period. You can see the lines don't quite follow each other, more like a mirror image. Yeah, in 2008, can you see it at the end, right? Exciting stuff, trend, uh, a trend break. It's, uh, you know, the, the sales of butter are going up again. Wow, something must have happened. So this is 2008, now it's 2015, right? What's happened? Well, it's gone up a bit more. We have a butter comeback. What did happen to the obesity epidemic? I'm sure some 
might want to know. And I'm going to show you exactly what happened in a while, OK? <laughs> so a little bit of a tease here. Let's discuss first why this happened. Why did we have this comeback of high-fat food? It sort of started with a very, very small event back in 2005, which, you know, might seem insignificant, but it turned out that it wasn't. It started with this woman, who's a general practitioner in northern Sweden. She's called Annika Dahlqvist. And, I mean, she wasn't really involved in this in any way, except that she had struggled herself with her weight her entire life, without much success, unfortunately, until in 2005 she tried the Atkins diet. You no know, low-carb, high-fat diet. And this was the first time she tried that kind of diet. She used to, you know, restrict calories. And here, something new happened for Annika, something she hadn't experienced before. Her weight started to drop without hunger, which is a nice thing, right? And uh, she lost like two pounds a week for an entire winter. And then she was, yeah, like she wanted to be. And she felt fantastic. In fact, she was like, you know, felt better than ever. So she felt like, what do you do? What do you do when that happens to you? And you're a doctor, and you have all these patients around you, right, with the same problems that you suffered from. So you, she read a lot of uh, you know, books and talked to people, and then she started to give the same advice to her patients. So told diabetic patients to eat more butter, and told you know, overweight people to not eat bread, and all of that stuff. So what happened? Well, same thing. Same as for her. They dropped in weight without hunger. Diabetics got healthier. So, what do you do when that happens? Well, you start a blog, of course. Yeah, so she did. And it beca became quite popular in Sweden. And she ended up in the papers, on the TV. And uh, yeah, not everybody was super happy about this, right? Because think back a decade, this was even more controversial than it is today. And a couple of dietitians notified the highest authority for the medical system in Sweden, which is the National Board of Health and Welfare, said that, you know, you have to stop this stuff. And uh, they could. They could, could tell Annika to stop doing that. She could get a warning. They could even take away her medical license if they felt it was necessary. But looking at the science, they found that, hey, this isn't really easy, you know. <laughs> Lots of science pointing in different directions. They had to do an investigation. It took two years until January of 2008, you know, where the butter curve <laughs> went up, right? Um, they came with a conclusion, and this sort of struck like a bomb into the national media. It ended up in all the TV channels, on all the papers, because it was this sort of perfect story, but tiny, one small doctor versus the big, big medical system. And the little doctor turned out to be right. Because this government agency said, keep doing what you're doing. We find nothing wrong. In fact, they said this, that low-carb diets can today be seen as compatible with scientific evidence and best practice for weight reduction. Not because it's been shown in a number of studies, and there is no evidence of any harm from this. And this turned out to be quite a revolution in the debate, because low-carb, as you know, has always been branded a dangerous fad diet. But now the highest you know, government authority said the opposite, said that, hey, this simply works, science proves it, and it's not as we can find dangerous. So what happened? Well, um, Dr. Eads, he showed some Google trend numbers for, for, for the world. I'm going to show some Google Trend numbers from Sweden. This is the number of people who search for different sort of diets in Sweden from 2008 up to 2015. And uh, I put in the five most popular diets during this period. It's a low glycemic index diet. It's paleo. It's intermit a, a, a form of intermittent fasting. And it's old-fashioned Weight Watchers. And then we have low-carb, high-fat in blue. Let's see what happened in 2008. You know, something happened, right? The blue line wasn't even on the radar. And then it starts going up and up and up and up and up. And by the end of 2010, it's number one in Sweden. So what happened after that? Did it, you know, did it stay popular? Well, 
pretty much so, you know, taking it to a new level. And I know that people in South Africa are familiar with this, but when, when the media sort of feeds on this and it's in the papers all the time, then, then it's quite a lot of attention. And this happened in 2011 up to start of 2013, and it was massive. And then it sort of became old news, and people more or less sort of accepted it. And it's not in the papers anymore, but as you can see, it's still going very strong. And in fact, you know, if you look at the blue line here, it's actually more popular still than number two to five combined, right, in a league of its own. And by the way, if anybody's wondering about these strange peaks, you know, what are they? Were they January 1st? <laughs> So if you want to publish a book on, on losing weight, you know when to publish it, right? So what does this mean? A couple of years ago, there was a survey, a telephone survey, that came to the conclusion that 23% of the Swedish population were on some kind of lower carb diet, not necessarily super strict, but 5% said they were on a super low carb, low carb, high fat diet. Uh, which is half a million Swedes, quite a lot. And it's also spilled over into our neighboring countries like Norway. And this is the border to Norway. When, you know, because uh, in Sweden we also, also had a butter shortage, but it was, you know, not quite that severe because we could import more, but it was kind of short lived. In Norway, they have these strange rules. They, you know, they're outside the European Union and, you know, they're not supposed to, they're supposed to do their own butter, right? So when it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> and then you get this sort of stuff. And, it even ended up on the Colbert Report, the severe Norwegian butter shortage. And this is a full page ad from that time. You know, you buy this $300,000 luxury car, and I'm going to give you a pack of butter for free. <laughs> Be a good deal. So, it seems like a little bit hysterical. Is it a fad? temporary fat. I mean, it's been going on for quite a number of years, but still, because this is what people say, right? Of course, I would say no. You, you would uh, expect that, but maybe not the reason. The reason is that this just works. You know, that's what the government investiga investigation showed. That's what lots of new studies are keep showing time after time, and that's the whole reason why it's become so popular all around the world. Because there hasn't been any big advertising about this, there has, hasn't been, you know, any government programs to tell everybody to eat more butter. Still, you know, in a way, more the opposite. No, it's become so popular because it works, people see that it works, and people tell other people, and it spreads organically like that. Today, it's fair to ask the other question. Is low fat a fad? Because this old food pyramid or this new graphic, nice graphic redesign, my plate, it's all based on this old idea that saturated fat raises the cholesterol and gives you a heart attack. So does it? Well, of course it doesn't, right? You've heard it many, many times. Lots of uh, new reviews of all the evidence showing no association between eating butter and dying of a heart attack. It doesn't make any uh, apparent difference. And lots of people in Sweden have been coming out saying this in the last few years. Real experts, like this professor of internal medicine in Sweden, Göran, Göran Berglund, he said this in, in Sweden's biggest paper a few years ago, that two generations of Swedes have been given bad dietary advice, and I've, I've avoided fat for no reason. And it's time to rewrite the dietary guidelines and base them on modern science. Or this professor of internal medicine saying that, you know, people have been recommending low-fat diets for 30 years, and then it turn out, turns out to be completely wrong. There is no proven connection between saturated fats and cardiovascular disease. At least that's what the research shows us, right? But what about reality? Isn't it really still, you know, dangerous to eat that butter, all that butter in the country? And will we not have a lot of heart disease? You think? 
You want to you want to see the statistics on heart disease in Sweden? Yes. Yeah. So the latest statistics are from 2013. Um, we have from two, from 1990 to 2013, and the green line I'm going to show you is men. The, the um, purple one is women. Let's see if it's going up. No, right? It's not going up. In fact, the green area here is, is the period when the battery consumption has, has shot up and it's going down quicker than ever. It's kind of hard to combine with you know, that old belief. How about we put the battery consumption in this slide in yellow? Check it out. Can you see any connection? It's kind of hard, right? In fact, in the last decade, we eat twice as much butter, and the risk of heart attack has been halved. Doesn't make any sense if you believe that butter is bad, right? So we have this problem. How do we change the way that we're used to believe? People often talk about paradigm shifts, and the interesting thing is they, they almost always happen in the same way. This is a, like a big change in how we believe about an important topic. Doesn't happen, you know, in a week. Doesn't happen in a month. Never does. You know, it takes time. And I'm just going to tell you a story about this guy. Does anybody know who he is? Semmelweis. Semmelweis. Yes, a hero of mine and many other people. He was a 19th century Hungarian doctor an obstetrician. And uh, back then they had a huge problem in hospitals in Europe where women were giving birth because there was, was this disease that once the woman had given birth, a couple of days later she might get a fever. Seem innocent at first, then it gets worse and worse and worse and she dies. You know, sometimes this happened to up to one in four women some periods, you know. It's an absolute disaster. Nobody know, knew why it happened. You know, there were certainly different theories uh, about something in the air or something. What Semmelweis found out was that there was this interesting statistical thing. You know, in, a, in a maternity ward where doctors usually uh, often went to the morgue to, uh, to autopsy patients and then they went to help women uh, give birth, this disease was rampant. You know, and in another ward, it wasn't that much of a problem. So he thought, hmm, maybe there's some sort of particle from these dead bodies that the doctors get on their hands, and then when they help the woman conceive, she, uh, or uh, give birth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it's not my first language, so I didn't mean to say that. Actually. <laughs> anyway, this is a serious subject, <laughs> at least. <laughs> okay, yeah, so this sort of particles from dead people gets into the woman and she gets sick, right? This was sort of like talking about zombies today. Didn't fit the paradigm. People didn't know about bacteria back then, right? Uh, so um, it made no sense, but Semmelweis de demanded, anyway, he was the chief of, of a ward, he de demanded that doctors wash their hands before they with chloride before they came into his ward. And what happened? Well, the death rates for women dropped to almost comparatively nothing, you know, by a lot. So, in fact, you know, if doctors watch, washed their hands ten times before examining a patient, they saved the life of a young mother. But they didn't, because it didn't make sense to them. And besides, you know, who could say that doctors' hands are dirty? That's a bit rude, right? So they kept, uh, you know, kept doing what they used to do. And uh, young mothers kept dying for decades. Semmelweis ended up in a mental hospital where he died, and his discoveries were ignored for a long time. Tens of thousands of women died for no, no good reason at all, until it sort of started to fit the bigger picture, you know, once we discovered what, what uh, bacteria are, right? And then it could, could, uh, could happen and, you know, lots of people could be saved. And this is how a paradigm shift usually happens. It takes a long time. So an older generation of experts may have to die off. <laughs> no, at least 
or at least get retired and stay, you know, stay retired uh, before. <laughs> the thumb keep coming back. Yeah. Uh, before a new generation can sort of take over and, and, and spread the new knowledge, right? And, and it shouldn't be surprising, you know, consider if you were a dietitian or a nutrition expert and you're in your 50s or 60s and you've been saying this for your entire career, you know, watch your fat intake, all that, watch your calories. And then, <laughs> then today you're going to say that, you know, forget everything I said, it's apparently the opposite, you know. I was wrong. Okay, and you you have to ex you have to accept for yourself that all this long career of work has been for no use, right? And you might even have to have have uh, harmed a lot of a lot of people, a lot of your patients. It's kind of hard to accept that. Would you be able to accept that? I'm not sure I would. You know, I'm relatively young. It was easier for me. You know, if I was, I think we have to accept that it's really hard. And it takes a long time, but this is what's going to happen. We used to think that saturated fat was bad. Now we're going to see that it is safe. Doesn't mean you have to eat butter for breakfast and lunch and dinner all the time. No, just means you don't have to be afraid of it, right? We used to think that carbs were good, even, even you know, fruit juice and stuff like that, bread. Now we're going to see it's not that simple. Too much carbs, especially bad carbs, sugar, and flour, especially if you're sensitive to it, it can make you fat and sick if you keep eating it for a long time. So this has been going on in Sweden for a long time. It's going on here, it's going on in the US, it's going on everywhere. But we can certainly, and it's because of the science, you know, and because of people's you know, experiences. Uh, but we can certainly anticipate a lot of resistance to this from people who, who are not ready for it yet. Like this, here's just an example from Sweden, a headline saying that fatty food gives you LCHF cancer. And I'm not sure where that cancer is, you know, where the LCHF organ is or whatever. But, <laughs> but apparently there is something called that. Uh, so what does the paper base this warning on? Well, there is a doctor who fears that this might be the case. There's no science. There's only a doctor who fears that it will happen. Here's an opinion piece in Sweden's biggest paper a couple of years ago saying that the popular fat diet is a threat to public health. And they were absolutely sure that this is going to make the heart attack, uh, heart disease rate uh, increase in Sweden. People are going to get more heart disease. Even though, you know, all the statistics are saying the opposite, right? But in their internal world, it's just not possible that it, this could happen, so they ignore it, right? Another professor in Sweden, the last one for a while, he said, it's time to face the facts. There is no connection between saturated fats and cardiovascular disease. So, how quickly will this paradigm shift happen? Is it already over in Sweden? Now, some of you might have seen this. Quite a few have asked me about it. It's a very, you know, well-spread article on the internet, 22,000 shares on, on Facebook, you know, lots of people have seen it. From 2013, and it says, Sweden becomes the first Western nation to reject low-fat diet dogma in favor of low-carb, high-fat nutrition. And it says that, you know, now everybody is recommended to eat a low-carb, high-fat diet. Is that true? Hmm. It seems a bit, you know, extreme even to me. I'm not sure that everybody needs to eat a low-carb, high-fat diet. We certainly don't have the, the data to prove it. No, this is based on this report that came out in 2013. And I'm, I apologize, you can't read Swedish, but it's called the Dietary Treatment for Obesity. It's a Swedish government expert report on all the science regarding, you know, how do you best treat people with <laughs> obesity, with a dietary intervention. And what they found was that yes, a low-carb, high-fat diet works the best in study after study. And here's some Swedish headlines. I'm going to translate them for you. For you. Experts say that LCHF is the most effective diet. It's expected to become a standard option in medical care. Fat food is the best for quick weight loss. LCHF is the best for quick weight loss. 
low-carb diet effective for obesity? And finally, LCHF is the best diet. But really, this is not giving out guidelines to the entire population. This is about the best diet for treating obesity, which is great, right? Fantastic. You know, if it was easy before being a doctor treating obesity with low-carb, high-fat, then it's super easy now. You just give them this uh, government report and it says, you know, this is works the best. And it, it's at, uh, even, it's not just for weight, it's also, you know, risk markers improve the most. And you've been shown this uh, chart many times. There are a number of fair trials showing that low-carb is more effective. This is just a list of 18 studies showing this, and no studies showing that low-fat is superior, which is a bit upsetting, considering that if you have obesity and you go to a doctor anywhere in the world, you're likely to hear the advice, eat less, move more and avoid fat because it's a loss of calories. And it's exactly this advice that never, ever wins a you know, fair trial. It's always, at best, similar, but often you know, worse. So, and if you fail, which most people do, and they come back to the doctor and say, doctor, this didn't work, what should I do? How about the doctor pull out this advice that is better? No, often they don't think that, that way. They think that, okay, here, this patient is a hopeless case. You know, he or she is too lazy, too, you know, too fond of food. She's not, never going to do this by herself. So we give her the recommendation that, you know, yeah, we can cut away your stomach so you can't eat, right? Obesity surgery, like gastric bypass surgery, very, very common in the world today. And I think we need to start questioning if this is a reasonable first line sort of option even before people try a low-carb diet. Because, you know, is there any disease in the organs we're cutting away? No. These are healthy organs, healthy stomachs, healthy parts of the intestines that we cut away, right? It's like a desperate sort of intervention. And uh, really, what we're doing is we're trying to surgically, surgically adapt our bodies to the industrial food system instead of adapting our food to our bodies, which would seem reasonable. Often the, the argument is that, you know, this is the final solution. There is nothing else. Once people end up on the operating table, they've already tried everything else. And, you know, this is what we have. But that's not true. I've heard so many cases where it's not true that it's not even funny, you know. Here's just one example. This is Johanna Engström. And uh, when she was a bit about 40, she uh, had fought with her weight for as long as she could take. So she decided, I want to have a gastric bypass surgery. And, uh, you know, she fulfilled all the, all the criteria. So, so she was put up on the waiting list for surgery. And some time later, it was her time. She got into a car with her family to the city where the surgery was taking place. Her family checked into a hotel. She checked into the hospital in the evening. And early the next morning, she was supposed to be rolled in for the surgery. But when she was, she told me her story herself. And she said that, you know, when she was there in that hotel, in that hospital room, looking out over the city, she basically panicked. And she felt that, no, I can't go through with this. It just feels wrong, you know. Just not, it's just not possible for me to do this. So after thinking about this as long as she could do, she went out to the people uh, running the ward, and she said, I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, I can't do this. You'll have to give the surgery to someone else. And she went home. She went to the hotel where her family stayed. And, and the next day she started eating a low-carb, high-fat diet, really. Because she'd been considering that for a long time, but never really gave it a fair shot. And she'd asked her doctor, doctor, is this something I could try? And he'd said, no, that's dangerous, doesn't work. Shouldn't do it. Well, when she did it, she lost over 100 pounds in a year. 
without hunger. And here's how she looked in a makeover story in a magazine with all her organs intact. That's kind of a fantastic <laughs> thing, right? Not bad. And you'd want more people to get the chance to try that out. At least not, you know, at least the doctors might not have to, you know, stop them for it, from it. Why? Why are they stopping people from doing that? Well, dietitians, doctors, many people in the medical system, they believe that this, which is an omelet with mushrooms, it seems, is, if you have that for breakfast, you're having an extreme diet. That is extreme, it's not natural, shouldn't do it, you know, we can't do it. No, but we can, we can uh, cut out healthy organs in, you know, 100,000 people. That's normal, we should do more of that, right? We should absolutely not eat food that people ate for thousands or millions of years. That is how sick, you know, our society is today. And it could very well become worse. Here's, uh, here's another thing you can do. If, if these um, uh, obesity surgeries don't work long term, I mean, sometimes they're fabulously effective short term. You can't eat, you drop in weight, of course. But often you start to regain after a year or two. And it's not uncommon that you regain all your weight, or most of it. So what do you do? Well, you can actually implant electrodes into your brain, into the reward center. And I think nothing says 1984 like electrodes in the brain, but you know, <laughs> actually some people are trying that. And if that doesn't work, there's another experiment they're doing back in my country in Sweden, where they put a tube into the stomach. You know, it hangs out underneath your shirt, right? Yeah, and, uh, and the idea is, of course, that you, you eat your food, and then you go to the bathroom, and you pull out the tube, and you empty everything into the toilet bowl. Which is fascinating to me, because why are they operating? Why are they putting a tube into the stomachs? You know, we already have one. Why have two, right? <laughs> we have one. It goes through the esophagus to the mouth, yeah. And I mean, this is what people have been doing for hundreds of years. Put two fingers into your mouth and you throw up, right? It's bulimia, it's a really nasty eating disorder. Maybe it can help control your weight, but you don't usually get that recommendation from your doctor, right? I think we should keep it that way. How about even, how about, you know, try some really extreme thing instead, like real food. Here's a friend of mine, uh, I know him now. I, I didn't know him when this picture was taken. He's called Ronnie Mattison, and he's from, from Norway. And uh, you know, he had uh, some weight issues for a long time. And then he decided, time to do something. He posted on Facebook, and he said, is it possible to lose 20 pounds in 10 weeks? And one of his uh, Facebook friends said, sure, let's go on a low-carb diet. Going to work great. So he tried it out, you know, and, and he's, uh, he's an impressive guy, so he decided I'm going to do something, uh, you know, to document this. And so he took a picture of himself in his underwear before and after he tried this. And then he put these pictures into his computer, into a sort of morphing program and made a movie. So the computer sort of uh, counts how it's going to look uh, in between. So let's have a look. This is Ronnie losing 70 pounds in nine months without being hungry, just by getting rid of the sugar and carbs. Pretty cool, huh? You can see it from the side, like this. And yes, he did lose 20 pounds in 10 weeks, so his friend was right. That's just by eating real food. No fancy operations necessary in that case. And I think at least, you know, I'm not saying that it works per per perfectly for everybody, but it's, it should definitely be an option to test before you lie down on the operating table, I think. Let's change topic to diabetes, which I find, you know, m even more fascinating, which shows you how exciting life I live. I, I don't have diabetes, I just you know, <laughs> find it fascinating. It is, I promise. So in 1985, there were about 30 million type 2 diabetics in the world. Do you know how many people we have today with that disease? 13 times more. This beats the, epi the uh, obesity epidemic hands down. What's going to happen in 2030? Well, they think, you know, the number keeps going up, but more than half a billion for sure. 
half a billion of people who are never going to get healthy again, who are going to get sicker and sicker every year. That's what we consider normal. But like Dr. Fang uh, mentioned in his talk the other day, maybe that's because we're not really treating the disease. Maybe it's because we're treating the symptom. That's why people get sicker and sicker. So we give them sick advice. We tell them to eat the stuff that turns into sugar in the gut, you know? Eat a lot of starchy food, blood sugar is going to go up, right? Or if you want to look at this, it's you know, sugar and starch and starch. So why do we do this? Well, it's because we believe that fat is really dangerous. Fat is oil, <laughs> it's in the top of the pyramid here. You know, it doesn't raise the, the blood sugar, but we believed that it causes heart disease. That's why. And if fat doesn't cause heart disease, we can throw this out with other garbage, right? So let's look for something better. Let's look back 100 years to a time when we were not afraid of fat, when we did not have modern medications for diabetes. And I chose this year only because that's when this book was published, and it's only one in many, you know. But it's a cookbook for, for diabetics. You can read it online. I'm going to show you um, page 12 and 13, which is the most interesting part. Shows you to the left what they're supposed to eat, to the right what they're not supposed to eat. And we start, what, uh, start to the right, start with what they're not supposed to eat. What is it? Well, number one is sugar. Number two is starches, and then we have a lot of stuff like flour, bread, biscuits, rice, and even macaroni, like pasta, right? So what's the, the headline on the page? Foods strictly forbidden, which is now the base of the food pyramid. When we have an epidemic of diabetics who are getting sicker every year, no matter how many drugs we give them, right? That's hardly a coincidence. Let's see to the left. What were they told to eat back then? Those are nice stuff, high fat stuff, like butter, can you see it? And olive oil, cheese, and meat, and eggs. And if you add a lot of vegetables, it's uh, you know, basically the same thing as I tell my di diabetic patients to eat today, a hundred years later. And I can tell you, everybody gets a better blood sugar from doing that. It's not even close. There are some good studies. You've seen it, I'm sure, in other lectures here. I'm not, I don't have the time to go through all the details of every study. You can find them on my free website, dietdoctor.com. I'm going to show you something more concrete. Because if you have diabetes, or if someone you know have diabetes, you can prove this to yourself very easily just by eating two meals and checking your blood sugar. So this is food I ate a couple of years ago. It's a big piece of meat, fried in butter. It's uh, vegetables, fried in butter. And it's uh, bene sauce, which is, of course, you know, egg yolks and melted butter. So, yeah, <laughs> lots of butter. Uh, yeah, it's like a nightmare for an old-fashioned uh, nutritionist. It's like a bomb of saturated fat that's going to go off. <laughs> and, uh, but almost no carbs. So, you know, when you eat this, you almost feel how your brain is shutting down from lack of carbs. No. Well, you know that doesn't happen, right? But what happens to your blood sugar? Vertically is my blood sugar, and horizontally is a number of hours after eating. This is what happened. It turned into a really boring evening, because I was sticking my finger all the time, and nothing was happening. <laughs> Very stubbornly stayed around 90. So if you don't eat hardly any carbs, you don't get any sugar into your bloodstream, right? And it stays the same. So, for some contrast, I went to the biggest obesity conference on the planet, which is called the International Congress of Obesity. In 2010, it was in Stockholm, Sweden, so I had to go there, right? Uh, to learn, I mean, 10,000 obesity doctors and researchers went there to learn how to treat their patients and, you know, do good research. Must be able to learn something, right? And uh, ironically, I got the worst lunch I've had for quite some time. Here they're serving it. And might not believe it, but you can read on the sign, the International Congress of Obesity, 2010, Stockholm, today's lunch, right? 
And here is the entire package. Wasn't really anything to choose from. Here is what you got. And there's sugar in the candy, of course. Also sugar in the fruit, even if it's packaged with some nice fiber and a little bit of vitamin C. And then there's plenty of added sugar in the yogurt. It's 12 grams per 100 grams. So the tongue curls up if you're not you know, prepared for it. Um, and the, the sandwich is pure starch. Of course, you know, you might, like me, have been hoping for some really great stuff in it, but you'd be, uh, you would have been disappointed. So said, it did say tuna sandwich, it did, you know, but to me, this is a homeopathic dose. Doesn't count <laughs> at all, you know. You can uh, just ignore that. I yeah, want some real stuff. So, what happened? What happened? I was a little bit shocked myself. I didn't think it would go up that high, but 180 in an hour or so. And then three or four hours later, it's, it's actually below normal. And I got this sort of hungry. It felt like going eating something really unhealthy. Now I didn't, and it stabilized anyway. But this sort of shows what happens with this kind of food. You get, you get full for a little while, and then you get hungry again. And you eat more, and you gain weight, right? And this is, this is a healthy curve. I mean, this is normal. After two hours, I'm down in normal. Uh, it's nothing wrong with that curve. Had I been a diabetic, it could have gone way up above the ceiling and stay there for many hours while the sugar is you know, damaging the body everywhere. This sort of diet is, in a way, what diabetics are told to eat today. It really is. You know, the, the uh, fruit is great, the yogurt is perfectly okay, the sandwich is fine, and then when you've been so good, right, and you're hungry, you need to allow yourself just a little bit of balanced, balance, you know, <laughs> a balanced lifestyle with bounty in this case, right? That's what they tell you. So, and here's a brochure from uh, uh, telling, telling Swedish diabetics how to eat. It says food for diabetics. And you could tell by the large bowl of fruit that it's not going to be super great. But, but you know, I'm not saying fruit is the worst. I'm just saying it's sugar. And perhaps the diabetic could find something better. But they say, say that food that raises the blood sugar slowly is good. And then they give examples like fruit, rice, pasta, potatoes, and bread. <laughs> Now, who thinks that it's good for a diabetic? Well, the people who hand out these nice free brochures are, you know, a pharmaceutical company. Yeah, and now it starts making even more sense because they sell drugs to lower blood sugar, right? And then they give out advice that raises the blood sugar. They even say it does. So the diabetic will get more blood sugar, meaning he's sicker, he will need more drugs, and they will make more money. I think that's not really good, right? Shouldn't we throw these out, find something better? It is a bit depressing. I was to uh, the largest conference on, on, on diabetes in the world, on diabetes research, it was in Vienna this fall. And we got served lunch. Can you believe it? Here, we're served lunch. Do you think, what, you know what is in the bag? Yeah, <laughs> same thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, and same thing happened to my blood sugar. I gets a bit depressed. It feels like total darkness sometimes. But then you get to a place like this. Have you seen the food out there? And it looks like this. Or like this. Or like this. Or like this. And just to appreciate the difference, compared to this, <laughs> or this. Yeah, so this is the biggest obesity conference in the world, serving processed junk that makes people fat. This is the biggest diabetes conference, serving processed junk that gives people diabetes. And here's this conference, real food that makes people hopefully healthy and helps with weight loss. So I think the organizers did a, a fabulous job. You know, uh, Professor Tim Noakes, Karen Thompson, John Proudfoot, yeah. I've been to quite a few conferences, uh, actually, and, and this is by far the best conference food I've ever seen. So there is some hope. <laughs> uh, 
Another thing that's good is that in Sweden we now, now have new guidelines for, for treating diabetes uh, in the medical system and, and they at least say that a moderate low-carb diet is an excellent choice, which is massive progress compared to before. So we had, you know, a number of things happen, you know. Low-carb is okay, it's okay for a doctor to give low-carb advice to patients, said, you know, the experts. It's okay to give a, at least a moderate low-carb diet to diabetics in the official guidelines to all of the medical care. And if you're going to treat obese patients, a low-carb diet might be the best thing to do. And we have this massive increase in, you know, searches for low-carb high fat. So something is happening, clearly. A professor in Sweden called Fredrik Nyström, he said this, I think it's good. When all recent scientific reports are lined up, the result is clear. Our deeply rooted fear of fat has been a mistake, and you don't get fat from eating fat, just like you don't become green <laughs> by eating vegetables. Okay. So, we had this but a comeback. What happened to the obesity epidemic? You know, it's going on all over the world, getting worse everywhere, hasn't turned around anywhere. How about Sweden? I think something is happening. You know, five years in a row, no movement. Last year, actually slightly, slightly down. And uh, I'm hoping if this conference goes to London and Washington in the coming years, I'm hoping to be able to come back and show you that it's turned around. Maybe like the first country in Europe, uh, maybe the first country in the world, maybe you will be first, who knows? It would be great to do it anywhere, right? And it's absolutely possible, it's just a question of time, right? If we realize the mistakes we made and face them and fix them, then it's going to become better. Absolutely. And big things are happening, you've seen this many times, I'm sure. 1984 and 2014, you know. Big changes. Eat butter. Scientists labeled fat the enemy why they were wrong. You know, it's getting widely known. And a lot of people are finding this out themselves. This is just three of them. Me, Vestedal, before and after she lost 170 pounds on a low-carb diet you know, to control of her sugar addiction. Here is uh, Marie Sörman, who didn't just lose pounds. She lost her type 2 diabetes. It's just gone when she eats like this. No medication. And here is Josephine Larsson one of many, many young people who never had to be hungry to be thin again, right? We can make more people have the chance to see that. So how do we, I mean, there's millions, hundreds of millions of people in the world who could benefit. Obese people, people with diabetes. How do we help do that, revolutionize the health of millions of people? It can seem like a hard thing to do, especially after, you know, knowing what kind of power these guys have. They, the resistance is massive. These huge companies all want to maintain the profitable status quo, right? It's like the cigarette industry 50 years ago. I think the change has to start from the bottom up. Like a viral sort of infection, <laughs> good infection spreading around the world, you know, from person to person, people inspiring others, right? And obviously we can use a lot of social media, you know, inspire other people, answer the questions, and perhaps someone here wants to do what I tried to do. I started a blog in Sweden seven years ago, and it's been an amazing journey. You know, I knew, knew nothing about blogging when I started. You know, there are lots of people who write better than me. There's lots of people who dress better than me, <laughs> which might be important, you know, because lots of blogs are about the owner's daily outfit. This is Kinsa. She's the most, the number one blogger in Sweden, the most read of all, you know. So I thought when I started, if I did the same thing, I would also have lots of readers, right? <laughs> it's bound to work, must work. But, but then uh, I realized it's not really my thing, so I have to write about what I know about which is not fashion, it's diet and health and science and boring things like that. And still, in a month, there were 500 visitors every month. 
in a year 5,000 and now it's 50,000 a year. Because there is a food revolution going on, because a lot of people are interested in this. And now we started a, an English blog called dietdoctor.com, add that in, it's 75,000 visits per day, pretty fantastic. So yeah, people want to know about this and we can make a difference. And using the internet, we have fantastic possibilities that we never had before, right? So maybe you want to start a blog. Maybe. Consider the difference you could make. You could help lots of people who are struggling today, I'm sure. You know, Semmelweis was certainly a hero, but he didn't have the possibilities that we have. You know, I predict that none of us will have to end up uh, in a mental hospital, I hope, at least. No, I, I think if we fight for it as long as it takes, we will change the world. Because, simple, like Victor Hugo said, everybody has heard this sometime, all the forces in the world are not so powerful as an idea whose time has come. Yeah. And the time has come, it is time for a food revolution, a low-carb, high-fat revolution, a real meal revolution. And yeah, it will improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people around the world. And it will make the world a better place. Thank you.